temperature has been defined, and in a lot of texts you'll find it defined that way, as the average kinetic energy in a substance. I don't personally like that because I think it really kind of misleads people as to what it means. And here's what I mean by that. If all the particles in a substance are traveling in the same direction, okay, no deviation, well that would have a lot of kinetic energy, right? Because kinetic energy is the energy of motion. But you could have a gas at nearly absolute zero with all the molecules moving in the same direction. Okay, so what's really happening is the molecules or particles have to be moving randomly. Okay, they have to be moving in different directions. <coughs> so, and kinetic energy isn't really what we're talking about here. It's really, what we're really talking about is momentum. Momentum is a combination of both uh, vector directionality and mass. Okay, it's a combination of the directions traveling and how fast and its mass. Okay, so it's really the random average momentum of a substance is a better way of defining what temperature is in my mind. Okay, just so you know. But most of the time they define it as average kinetic energy in a substance. Okay? What is a better one? <laughs> average random momentum. Average random momentum. Random momentum. Okay? Alright. So then, that's that's temperature. That's one of the main things. Now I need to spend a little bit of time talking to you about some uh, 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 something else that's highly related to um, polarity. Okay, and there's a special category of polarity uh, that really is all, it's, it's such a strong polarity that it lies somewhere between polarity and a covalent bond. Okay, it's not truly covalent, but it's not completely polar either. And it's called hydrogen bonding. Okay, hydrogen bonding. So if we're to get out the periodic table, and I'll remind you about something we learned in unit two, because that's where we learned the ridges of the periodic table. Remind you that as we go across each row of the periodic table, the atoms get smaller. You go down a column, they get larger, but across each row, they get smaller. So fluorine, by comparison to all these other atoms in the same row, is a very small atom. And it's small by, by comparison to any place else in the periodic table because they get bigger going down. It's also the most electronegative element, right? And it turns out that these three elements, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, are so small, so electron dense, and so electronegative that they have some special properties that allow them to do something special called hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is uh, the thing that's not quite, it's a little more than polar and not quite covalent, but sort of like covalent, somewhere in between, okay? So remember we looked at this the other day, we looked at how we uh, figure out whether uh, ammonia is a polar molecule, okay? More than polar, less than covalent. Now, this hydrogen bonding happens between two molecules. It doesn't happen within a molecule. Hydrogen bonding happens between two molecules, not within a molecule. So it doesn't happen inside this ammonia molecule, or a water molecule, or a hydrogen fluoride molecule. It happens between this molecule and another one. Okay. Well, remember, the polarity of nitrogen, or the electronegativity of nitrogen, is so great, and hydrogen is just a proton and electron, and it's pulling on the electrons of the hydrogen. It leaves almost a naked proton out here. Okay? There's almost nothing else but a proton out here because the electrons are most of the time spending their time up here. Okay? If electrons were kids, and these hydrogen houses had board games, and the nitrogen house had an Xbox, the kids will be spending more time up here, and that's kind of what's happening, okay? So it's very polar, leaving this almost naked. Well, that means that this hydrogen wants to have a, some protons, because it's most of them are being taken away by the nitrogen. And it can get those protons by sharing, or almost sharing, not quite, because it's not really truly covalent. It can almost share the two electrons in a lone pair on a nitrogen, or an oxygen, or a, 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 a fluorine and a hydrogen fluoride. Okay, and so what you get is a hydrogen bond. All right, it's not a true bond in the sense that it's covalent, but it's a little more than being polar too. Okay, and this is very directional and very specific as to length. So the length of a hydrogen bond is very specific, and it's also very directional. It's how the two halves of a DNA molecule, or actually the two DNA molecules making up what we call DNA, it's how they stay together. Okay, so it's not as strong as a covalent bond, 
which means you can strip the two parts of a DNA apart because you can strip it where it's a little weaker here, where the hydrogen bonds are, without taking apart the covalent bonds in a, in a DNA molecule. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. All right. So I'm sure you remember seeing DNA structures like this. Okay. Well, all of these pieces holding them together here, right through here like this, that's all hydrogen bonding holding together. So let's take a little closer look here. Uh, here we have an oxygen, okay? And here is that amine group from unit four. We learned it was amine. So it's kind of like the ammonia, only we've got two hydrogens here, and the other hydrogen that would be on an ammonia is connected to a carbon instead. But we still have the right conditions. We've got an ammonia or an amine molecule here, or part, the amine part of a molecule, that has a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. Um, and then we've got hydrogens off of there, and those hydrogens are nearly stripped of their electrons, and that makes it like a proton sticking out there, and it wants to have a, a lone pair of electrons because it wants a pair of electrons. And the oxygen over here, which is double bonded to a carbon down here, this oxygen has two lone pairs. And so that's the opportunity then for this amine functional group to hydrogen bond to this double bonded oxygen, which is kind of a ketone group here. Okay. Down below that, we've got an NH group. So a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, still got the same conditions we need for hydrogen bonding to take place. And here's another nitrogen that has a lone pair. And so you've got the opportunity for hydrogen bonding to take place. Now the reason that uh, guanine and cytosine only connect to each other in DNA is because, look, there are three hydrogen bonding sites, okay? The reason that, oh, I didn't mean to jump in that high. Let's back out a little bit. Or that close, rather. The reason that adenine and thymine uh, only bond together is because there's only two hydrogen bonding sites. And while it is conceivably possible that this guanine could attach to this adenine, they don't because it's more stable and therefore, therefore thermodynamically favored for the guanine and the cytosine to uh, bond together and more thermodynamically favored then. Well, really, it's more favored for those to happen and therefore adenine and thymine are the ones that actually connect together. So the hydrogen bonding sites are just in the right place and just the correct ori orientation for it to be possible for hydrogen bonding to take place, and you get as much hydrogen bonding to take place as possible. And so thermodynamically, it makes sense for it to happen that way. And that's why the two sides of the DNA uh, are linked up together, unless you change the surrounding chemistry or temperature in such a way as to allow the two sides of the DNA to split up. And that's what happens in a cell when DNA replicates, it, replicates itself. It, the chemistry is changed, and that chemistry change is what causes the DNA to separate. But the hydrogen bonding here is not as strong as the covalent bonding. So when the DNA breaks up, it splits along the hydrogen bonding lines while not splitting up the covalent bonding that's going on between those atoms. Okay. Now let's take a look at water for a minute because that's, that's another thing that's important as far as hydrogen bonding. If we're looking at this, these red balls represent oxygen and the white balls represent hydrogen and the white bar is the covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen here. Okay. And so the dotted line shows where there's hydrogen bonding take place, takes place. So liquid water has about, on average, two-thirds of the possible hydrogen bonding sites connected and the other one-third not. But remember, water molecules are moving around each other. And we've done this activity in class. We said that solids are linked together. They wiggle and twist, but they don't separate, okay? And they don't move around each other. But when you get something to go from being a solid to a liquid, then they start to move around each other. So my fists are like molecules moving around each other. So back to our uh, water molecules uh, arranging themselves as ice. Um, if, the, if all of those hydrogen bonding sites link up, because those hydrogen bonds are so specific as to direction and length, it actually causes the water molecules to expand when they freeze. Water molecules in liquid form, on average, can be closer together, on average, than water molecules that are frozen. When they, fro when they freeze, all the hydrogen bonding sites link up, and you get a crystalline shape that expands. That's why water expands when it freezes. That's what causes potholes. Water gets down in the pavement, it freezes, it pushes out on the pavement, pushing it away from the undersurface, and so you get potholes. It's why we have uh, rock slides in the mountains during the winter. 
water gets under uh, or into cracks in the rock. The water expands. It breaks off the rock. We have rock slides. Um, and it's also why ice, because it becomes, uh, it, because it is less dense when it freezes, um, because the water expands when it freezes, ice floats on the top or is on the top of a pond or a lake uh, in the wintertime. And that's where the fish can live underneath. You can go ice fishing in the wintertime. All right, let's take a minute and talk about the five assumptions or postulates of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Now, you just need to memorize these. These assumptions about the kinetic molecular theory or the assumptions about the way gas molecules behave is why we can use the gas laws we use in high school chemistry. If we were to not use these assumptions, the math would be a lot more complex. So what I've told you in class is, well, as long as your temperature isn't too low, so as extremely low temperatures mean gases behave in a non-ideal form, which means it's not, a behaving, it's not behaving in accordance to this kinetic molecular theory of gases, or if the pressure is too high, then gases don't behave in accordance to this kinetic molecular theory of gases. Um, but it's also true that if we were to do measurements with gases that were really, really, really precise, out to the tenth decimal place or something of the like, then the math would also not quite work out. But most of the time, our measurements with gases is not that precise, and it's not necessary to be that precise for the work we need to do. And so we get gas laws that we can that are simpler and can be a kind of an average, a really close average, and it works just fine for us. Because if we were to use the more complex equations, by the time we round it off, because we're not doing real precise measurements, we get the same answer anyway. But it's important to know that when gas behavior is not ideal, we need to know why. We need to know why we can use those gas laws, the ideal gas law, Charles Law, Boyle's Law, the combined gas law, Gay-Lussac's Law, Avogadro's hypothesis, and we can all use those when they're not entirely true. Because these conditions here describe things that would be uh, extreme if they weren't assumed to be true for the use of the gas laws we use. So gases consist of large numbers of tiny particles far apart relative to their size. In fact, they're so far, far apart, and the gas particles are so small, we assume their volume to be zero for the purpose of the ideal gas law, or for the Charles law and all these other gas laws. Um, but we know that's not true. We know that for anything, we know that the definition of matter, for example, I'm sure you've been taught this before, uh, is, a, is something that has, um, takes up space and has volume. Well, taking up space means it has volume. So they're very tiny to the point of assuming them to have no volume. We know that can't be true. We treat it like it's true because it makes the math easier, and most of the time the math works out just fine for what we want to do. Collisions between gas particles and between particles of the container of the walls are elastic. No loss of kinetic energy. We know that doesn't happen. Everything that collides one thing to another loses kinetic energy. There is an exchange of friction energy. Uh, but for the purposes of our gas laws, that amount of energy loss is so slight as to make it negligible. You know, it's like saying, um, I'm going to uh, weigh myself. And while I'm weighing myself, a speck of dust lands on my head. Well, technically, that's changing my mass or the two of them together changes my mass, changes the overall mass, but it's not going to show up on the scale. We're not going to see it, the, the, the scale change when I'm weighing myself on a bathroom scale because a speck of dust lands on my head. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. The, the difference is so small that we don't have to worry about it. Okay? Gas particles are in continuous, random, rapid motion. They therefore present, possess kinetic energy, which is energy of motion. And this is defi a definition of temperature. Okay? Temperature can be defined as the average kinetic energy in a substance, or more correctly, the average random momentum of the particles in a substance. Okay? There are no forces of attraction between gas particles. That's assumption four. Well, we know there are forces of attraction, but <clears throat> the speed at which gas molecules move around is so great <clears throat> that the attraction is kind of overcome. You know, they hit really hard and bounce right off. It's like if I were to take a tennis ball and throw it to a uh, surface that can, has um, um, uh, Velcro on it. If I throw it hard enough, it won't stick. But if I slow it, throw it slow enough, it will stick to the Velcro. Well, that's kind of like gas molecules. There may be attraction between gas molecules, but they hit, they're hitting so fast and so hard, so hard that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect anything to any great degree. 
And then, of course, temperature of a gas depends on the average kinetic energy of the particles in the gas. So we've already talked about that. But those are the five assumptions. You need to know that by memory. Okay. We're kind of running short on time, so let me go over this, okay? You need to know this stuff. It comes from Unit 4, but it's the kind of thing you need to know for this test, and you will need to know for the next unit as well, okay? So the question is, is this a polar molecule? And there are two conditions for us in our super, simpl super simplified to the point of absurdity way of figuring out where the molecules are polar. And we're super simplifying it because it's high school chemistry. It's just an introduction, introduction to it, okay? So the way you figure this out is you start out by figuring out the valence electrons, and there are four for a carbon, one, two, three, four, using uh, electron dot formulas, and then chlorines have seven, and we have four chlorines, all right, and then we're going to share electrons in a way that gets both the carbons and the chlorines uh, so they have eight electrons when we're done because they want to have a full valence that's called the octet rule. Eight, meaning octet. And so the result is we get a Lewis dot formula that looks like this. And we could draw a Lewis formula, but we don't really need that to figure out the shape. To figure out the shape, we're going to count the sets of electrons around the atom of interest. Sets can be two electrons, can be four electrons, can be six electrons. In this case, all the electrons we're sharing between the two atoms are two sets of two. Okay? So there are two electrons shared between this carbon, this chlorine, and every other one. And to arrange four sets as far apart in space as we can get them around that atom of interest, you're going to have to have what's called a tetrahedral. Okay, now that's not flat. It's not 90 degrees. It's 109.5 degrees. And so we got a carbon here, and one angle is going up like this, for example, and one's coming at about 109.5 degrees this way, and the other two, since it's more than 90 degrees, have to be turned like this. Okay, have to be turned like this to do that. So one will be coming out toward you like this, and one's going back behind like that. Okay? All right. So that's a tetrahedral electron pair shape. Then what you do is you take wherever, sometimes we have lone pairs on that atom of interest. In this case, we have no lone pairs. So in this case, we're going to replace all those pairs of electrons out here with the atoms they're shared with. We don't need these lone pairs on these. We just need to replace it with the atoms, and this will give us a molecular shape. And so we have a tetrahedral molecule. And a tetrahedral molecule is even all the way around. There's not an uneven arrangement. There is an even arrangement of polar bonds. Now, the bonds are polar. If you, do the, if you find the electronegativity difference between carbon and chlorine, um, let's see, uh, that's about, what, anybody do the actual math or just do the average? Anyway, it's, 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 it's polar, okay? What is it? 3.16, is it 3.16 minus 2.55? So that's what, no, oh, I don't know, I did the wrong thing here. Let's see. 3.16 minus 2.55. All right, so we got 0 0.61. So that's in the polar range, okay, for us in this class. In our super simplified to the point of absurdity way of figuring out polarity, we said if it's 0.5 or above, it's going to be polar, right? So 0 0.6 is polar. So the bonds are polar, but the molecule is evenly arranged. And you've got to have both polar bonds and an uneven arrangement of those polar bonds to have a polar molecule, yes? So this is a nonpolar molecule, even though the bonds are polar. Now, let's do this. Let's take and replace one of these chlorines with a hydrogen. Okay? So I'll put one hydrogen here, and I'm going to put chlorines on all these other places. Okay? All right, now, is hydrogen and chlorine a polar bond? Is it? It's right at the border, by the edge of being polar, isn't it? But now here's the critical thing. Which direction is the polarity? Which one of the two, hydrogen or chlorine, is more electronegative? Carbon. So the polarity runs in this direction. That makes sense? 
Where, which direction does the polarity run in the carbon to chlorine bond? Chlorine. Toward chlorine. So all of these have polar bonds in this direction. Does that make sense to you? All right. Now then, what you can see by looking at these arrows is that the polarity goes this way and then out this way. So overall, it's kind of running downhill, at least the way I've drawn it. Does that make sense? So this now goes from being what was a nonpolar molecule, but this is a polar molecule because now overall, we've got polarity running in that direction. So it's not just an uneven arrangement. It's an uneven arrangement of polarity. Okay? Got it? So that, that's a polar molecule while that one's not. Anybody have any questions about that? So it's important that you can look at the structure and figure out whether a molecule is polar or not. Now, some things you just kind of know, OH groups on a carbon chain, that's polar because we just talked about it so much, right? And NH2 groups on a carbon chain, that's polar because we talked about it so much, right? But some things you have to be able to figure out. All right, so that goes back to unit four. And if you need to review, review, go back and look at the videos on the YouTube channel, all right, and make sure you can do that.